All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, the Changemakers Conversations. Uh, if you saw uh, me earlier on the stage and you're wondering how come uh, I was able to uh, be in front of the camera so quickly uh, with this virtual background, I am a, a marathon sprinter. Uh, actually, that doesn't make sense. Um, but uh, um, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this uh, session. Uh, obviously, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, the Changemakers Conversations, I've had the opportunity ho to host uh, the, the prior sessions as well and I think it's one of the most engaging sessions where we can actually deep dive into the hits of some of the most successful founders and uh, uh, the panel today is going to be an amazing panel um, but before I talk about uh, the people speaking let me just talk about the topic that we are focusing on and the topic is really about um, growth in Asia, like how important it is to localize to actually accelerate growth, especially as, you know, uh, our representatives of Asia, it has really emerged, emerged as a force to be reckoned with in, in all spheres, right? Uh, from an economic perspective, uh, from a technological perspective, and from a cultural perspective, Asia has really grown to be uh, a, a real force, right? And in, in its rapid development of, you know, in the digital economy presents new challenges, but at the same time, it also presents a huge, huge opportunity and an opportunity that startups within the region should capitalize on. And that's really what we're trying to tackle today. Uh, how do we make full use of the, the geography that we're in uh, and really capitalize that market and then, you know, take over the world? Because I assume that's uh, what all startups aim to do, take over the world. So that's uh, uh, what I think is uh, uh, we're going to be talking about. And um, I think what's important as well uh, for me, my personal experience is uh, I run a startup called Mantheos and we do uh, an open web intelligence uh, that does help with uh, business and analytics and it helps identify insights and opportunities for our clients, for our customers. Um, and, you know, the thing there is that most of, our, most of my clients are based in the US and they're based in Europe. Right. So if anyone, uh, Prof Annie, if you're hearing this, I will be guilty of not, you know, uh, fully capitalizing on my presence here in Asia. Um, and I'll let you grill me for that later. Uh, but uh, uh, it's going to be very interesting for me to understand how important is uh, the local market and therefore the regional market. Um, and with that, I would like to also introduce Prof Annie Ko. Uh, Prof Annie Ko is the Professor Emeritus of Finance uh, from SMU. Uh, she is an absolutely uh, lovely lady. Um, later you'll find and you'll be able to hear from her. She's also going to be moderating this session uh, and uh, I'll leave her in your good hands. But before that, I'm just going to give you uh, a highlight of all of the people on our panel. First up, we have uh, Michele Ferrario, who is the co-founder and CEO of Stashaway, for which some of my money is inside. Mm -hmm. So Michele, <laughs> good on you. Uh, that's already some good customer validation right there. Um, next, we have uh, Lu Liu, who is uh, mm -hmm. the co-founder and COO of JustCo, for which I've also uh, a desk at as well. So uh, good on you. Great customer validation there too. Um, and next up, we have... Uh, uh, San Santi Tan, uh, who is the group chief economist of, uh, economist of C Group, for which I also have bought some stocks off. So go wow. on you, that's uh, some fine uh, validation as well. Um, and last but not least, we also have Andrew Young, who is the associate director uh, mm -hmm. for the innovation of uh, Sino Group. Unfortunately, uh, not much affiliation for me there. Um, but uh, this is our very esteemed panel um, of guests. And with that, I'm going to leave you in the safe hands of Prof. Aniko. Prof. Aniko, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. You can dream about getting a property in the Far East group. <laughs> and that will have something to do with Sino. <laughs> okay, yep. thank you, everyone. We have over 500 uh, in the audience virtually. And I know we are slightly uh, overrunning, but uh, my wonderful panel have agreed that we'll go past 2 o'clock and we will have a hard stop around 2.20. Uh, many thanks to a couple of you who have now come in with it great questions on pigeonhole. So what I'm going to do is pretty fast and we'll do one round first of all of quick introduction. Uh, I know they have a sterling CV but nothing like hearing it from them up close and personal. So with no particular order, I'm going to start with Dr. Sandy. Okay, Sandy, all right, I'd love to have you tell us a little bit uh, about your background. You have actually an amazing uh, scholarly background but you were chief economist in Credit Suisse. 
what made you get out of Credit Suisse and join a startup? Because when C was just Garena, what made you say, this is the place I want to go to? Give us a little bit of that background. Sure. Thank you very much, Prof. Nico, and great to be this very dis distinguished panel. And hello, everyone um, tuning from, from everywhere. Um, so yeah, no, great question. I think if you know, one word comes to mind is the word impact. Um, I actually wrote a report, I think back in 2017, when I was still at Credit Suisse, about how I think that ASEAN, Southeast Asia, is still a, a, a hidden tiger, and that the digital economy can really wake this um, um, tiger up and really uh, get it to really reap the full potential of the rising consumer consuming power, the very entrepreneurial society. So I think that's where I got really excited. And I think I really want to actually walk the talk and see for myself what it's like at the frontier. So that's when I chose to join um, um, C. And of course now see we have three key business in the region, uh, Garena, which is game publisher and a game developer. Globally, we are in over 130 countries. Um, Shopee is our e-commerce, which is in Southeast Asia and Taiwan. And we also have a digital financial service called C-Money, which is in uh, Southeast Asia. Mm, very nice. So uh, this is your fifth year in C? Um, third, third, third year, third, third year, year coming to fourth. Yeah, fourth, it always yeah. feels a bit longer when you're on this side of the... <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like 10x, you know, in terms of time yes. as well. Okay, let me move to Lou. All right, so Lou, you actually uh, graduated from Stern and this is your first job when you join JESCO, um, Stern and yes. Columbia, okay? Yes, uh, I graduated from NYU, uh, the same as you. <laughs> uh, also my husband, Wan Singh, that's where I met him. And then after that, uh, I actually worked at Ernst & Young and also Procter & Gamble. Uh, and in between, my, I got my MBA from Columbia. Uh, so uh, before JESCO, I actually had two corporate jobs uh, with uh, big American companies, but then it has been a very exciting journey with uh, JESCO. So we founded the company about 10 years ago. Uh, when we saw a huge opportunity in, you know, really bringing in better, more flexible, collaborative environment into Asia. So the concept of co-working was already very popular in the West, but not so much so, you know, back 10 years ago in Asia. So we decided to introduce here uh, to the users here and do it the Asia way. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are very proud, you know, over the 10 years, we have managed to grow to uh, over 40 locations across nine countries in Asia Pacific. Uh, so later I can also talk more about, you know, how the work environment and experience is very different, very collaborative, mm -hmm. that enable everyone to really work and live better. Thank you very much. I love it that it's a 10 year startup. So a lot of people in the audience will ask, how has that evolved? And we'll come to that in a little while. And I'm gonna to jump to Michele. Michele, you're actually getting a lot of questions coming in on the pigeonhole, but never mind. we'll okay. come to that later. Tell us about yourself. People reading your profile would say that you are a serial entrepreneur. You just love startup. Well, yeah. So I am the co-founder and CEO of Stash Away. I started the company with two co-founders four and a half years ago. And we're currently in three markets live. We're in Singapore, in Malaysia, and Dubai. And we have open offices in two more markets that obviously we would like to launch in the foreseeable future, uh, Thailand and Hong Kong. Uh, in my previous Part of my career, I spent the first half in a more traditional setting in and around financial services with McKinsey and then in private equity. Uh, and then the second half, building consumer internet companies, I guess what people might be referring to is the fact that when I was at Rocket Internet, I was on the very early stage side of things initially. So I launched five companies for Rocket. And then I, I was the CEO of Zalora where I was actually responsible for the scale up. But to be fair, Stashway is the first company I start from scratch. So the, the, the first time I actually called myself an entrepreneur. Oh, very nice. So you were a caretaker in all the others. And now this one, right? It's your baby. I know. Okay, yeah. very good. And I, I guess the audience heard it loud and clear. Michele says there'll be two more markets. He's already named it, Thailand and Hong Kong. All right. So we might get stash away in Phuket after all. You. Okay, I'm going to jump to uh, Andrew Young. And Andrew, thank goodness you are here. Because one of the prizes, all right, in our uh, you know competition, actually come from the Sino Group. But I think for everyone in the audience, they are so curious. Why did Sino Group start this innovation center, and how long has it been around? But of course, I love it, Andrew, that you are actually affiliated to two 
the universities and the polytechnic and you're still closely linked to it. Give us a little yeah. bit of the background and the vision for Sino Green. Right, thank you. So um, I have a, like a track record last 20 years, probably I've been involved in various startups and proud to joining Sino Group. I was uh, the chief commercial officer of the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park and we, we nurture like over 800 companies throughout that period. So I had a, quite a background in working with startup um, and, uh, and, and cut across bio and, you know, car and design and everything. And uh, Sino uh, wanted to get into innovation technology field and, and we started the innovation lab about two and a half years ago. And over the last two years, although last year kind of been a, a difficult period, we probably work with over 200 company and, and then we, we, we've gone deep dive into uh, at least two dozen of so 20 to 30 and every one point in time and um, we're, uh, we're interested in technology that improves property but also well-being of the human well healthcare we're not so much in the bio but healthcare and then the other one we're really into is environmental technology something that could really improve how we live the environment of course, how we interact with customer, et cetera. So we've got a broad domains. So that's where we're coming from. Thank you. So I'm going to do a quick <laughs> second round. I'm going to incorporate some of the questions that have come out on Pigeonhole. So please keep those questions coming because you will definitely be paid attention to. I'm going to start with you, Andrew, because uh, everyone in this audience, all right, they are coming from different parts of the world. So that 25 to 30 that you spend a lot of time <laughs> within Sino Group in the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Do they come from different parts of the world? Mm -hmm. And what kind of specific examples are there? Mm -hmm. Are there any unicorn amongst that group? Well, um, we've been <clears throat> mainly working with uh, companies in earlier startup phase because I do believe there's a lot of gem in those. And really mm -hmm. the domain, I've been traveling a lot. Uh, you know, I look into Vancouver, Toronto, um, <clears throat> Israel, London, uh, in, in, in UK, and uh, Zurich in, in uh, Luzon in, in, in Switzerland, etc. So we kind of cross many different areas. And, we, and uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is help this, uh, work with this startup to explore the vast market potential mm. here in Asia. I mean, of course, Hong Kong is part of the GBA, the Great Bay Area of China, but we also see Southeast Asia as, as uh, one of the other panel members mentioned, it's a big uh, rising uh, consumer uh, economy and, and there's heaps and heaps of potential. So we really want to help the startup to say, look into the growing Asian market, mm. uh, the China market. I still, I think there's so much, but as the economy grows, um, and especially COVID, everybody demand different and better living conditions and better healthcare and better environment. So I think COVID really bring about a lot of change in how we live, how we run finance and traveling and, and, and everything. So that really, I get so excited. We see so much potential even coming through. Going forward, we've been looking at AI and robotics and how robotics can help us manage asset, build different buildings. We've looked at, uh, currently we're, we're on an exciting venture looking at the recycling plastics into concrete blocks that we can build concrete materials with 50% uh, recycled plastic into each pavers. Uh, we've been looking at environmentally uh, friendly, but a paint from Italy that can really clean the air. So again, you know, they are, they are, I predict some of these will be future unicorn, but I think we'll keep a very close eye on some of these exciting venture globally from all over the world. Thank you, I love it. All right, and Andrew, I could tell that there's fire and you know in your eye when you're talking about those startups. So let me jump to you, Michele, because here is a question everyone has been asking. What are some of the challenges that Stashaway face mm in localizing across Southeast Asia. You're in three markets now. How did you overcome those challenges? So we are a digital wealth management platform. What that means is that we are regulated. So the first and quick answer to your question is, every, you know, we need a license in every country where we go. We are a fund manager uh, in, in every country. 
and that takes time and effort uh, to overcome. It takes capital as well. You know, you need a million dollar in Singapore, two million ringgit in Malaysia, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and most importantly, it takes time because, uh, you know, to convince, especially some of the regulators can take up to more than one year from when you start the conversation to when you actually get a license that allows you to operate. So the short answer to your question is regulation and licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way I think about it is that the complexities <coughs> <clears throat> or when you are before you sold them are a problem once you sold them are embarrassed to entry for other people and mm -hmm. so i think there is a inherent competitive advantage that you build by building an organization that actually is willing to solve complex problems because not everybody is willing to do that and so if you're able to solve those problems you're actually going to be one of the few and therefore are able to build actual value over time thank you broadly speaking mm. yeah and now it's going to jump in because I want to take more questions, but a quick one. You keep saying that yours is digital. So although you have to handle regulatory, what about the experience, the customer experience? Do you need to localize that or you don't? Uh, we try to keep it as standard as possible. I, quite, I believe that we currently live in a very globalized world where uh, kind of successful global brands are the same brand everywhere and successful global experiences are the same everywhere. So we try to keep it as consistent as possible. Um, obviously, there are some localization, you know, driven by language, driven by regulation, driven by certain specific demands of clients. And we try to respond to clients' feedback and localize usually after launch. Uh, but in general, my point of view is that it, it, sometimes people tend to over localize and that creates cost and disruption while when you have a, a recipe that works maybe 90 percent of the recipe would work in other countries and you need to localize 10 percent of it mm, very good so now this is where you you yours is definitely not just digital yours is very physical enhanced with a lot of digital all right tools as well so there's a question here someone just asked you made a statement that you want to do co-working space the Asian way. Can you give us an example of how you localized and decided that it's worth localizing? Because Michele just now was saying that he's 80-20. What about yours? Okay, uh, so for me, uh, there are three, three things I would like to to maybe uh, introduce when we localize. Mm -hmm. So we definitely are a global company, but with a local mindset. So first thing is really having the right team in place. So in fact, all our um, GMs, sales managers, and community managers, those serving our customers locally are all from local. So that's actually very important in how we roll out locally to make sure, you know, once they are uh, in our space, all the hospitality and service is actually coming from, you know, people uh, locally who know the local customers the best and also it's about putting the structure in place so we do uh, have a central team that makes sure you know the policy making and the consistency of how we train up our people so that's come, coming from HQ but importantly the local GMs are empowered to make decisions very fast and effectively so they can mm -hmm. again serve the customers uh, mm -hmm. you know very uh, fast, fast and effectively and then another thing I would like to mention is having very strong local partners. So for example, for us, we have GIC and Fraser's mm -hmm. who are not only our investors, but also bring value to us as property developers. So when we go into an, a new market that can help us with property selection, you know, provide the network and local know-how. So that's actually one of you know, our success factors, how we can ramp up so quickly across the eight countries. Mm. Um, and then lastly, I would like to mention uh, also, uh, you have to pay attention to not only the software, but hardware, because for us, it's also physical space. So how we do it is we design with the local customers in mind. So maybe just one quick example, for example, in Taiwan, uh, people there are really environmental friendly. So we actually partnership with a local Taiwanese vendor to putting a lot of recycled materials mm -hmm. in our furniture in the Taiwan location. Mm -hmm. So these are just some of the examples, of what I mean by, you know, uh, being a global company, but always having a local mindset to be able- Are to you in it. Hong Kong? Are you in Hong Kong at the moment, Lu? Uh, no, so we are mm -hmm. in uh, I see. I see Andrew smiling. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to talk. Uh, yeah. so I'm, trying to, China, I'm trying so, to close uh, that deal here. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah, have to, you have to, you have to uh, quickly give give us that uh, deal, and then you can donate to IIE. 
definitely. So, so I'm just teasing you, like, and actually there is a question from someone who asked whether you have, uh, you know, have tried expanding to Hong Kong and if there is a tip, but I guess that uh, doesn't apply at the moment, but I'll ask you that later, Andrew. I'm going to come to Sandy now. Sandy, you have about two or three questions, but I'll bundle it together with what I intended <clears throat> to ask you. So, you know, for everyone who is in the audience, um, the way C has evolved is actually innovation after innovation. So how do you keep innovating as a startup? You know, you, you've actually identified both e-commerce, games, you know, and then now uh, digital payments. How do you keep on adding on the parts? Yeah, um, it's a very good question. I, I think it all stems from the core of uh, having very customer-centric mindset. And in fact, we, I'm not even sure we can call ourselves as innovator. We just actually listen very closely to what the customers want and how that those wants and needs keep evolve, evolving over time. And just to give you an example, so you know, we started with the games publishing business um, and very quickly we realized the importance of localization, even, even when we come to games. Um, and then the, you know, the need to have local teams to really understand the changing uh, customer preferences, the uh, different characters, different influencers. Um, and it's true those uh, local presence in um, all the countries, like uh, I think six, seven markets. And um, we got to learn that there are actually gaps in the market. Uh, for example, you know, around payments, where yeah. how do you pay, pay for games, all these things. That's when we started the digital financial business to solve some of the pain points really to payment infrastructure. And then um, 2015, that's when we realized that actually there's also another a big gap that in e-commerce markets, there's no kind of go-to mobile platform, mobile centric platform for e-commerce, which is really social centric, you know, based on chats, really fun. And a lot of the long tails uh, cater to a lot of huge, um, very capable entrepreneurs and millions of SMEs in the region. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge gap and underserved markets there. And that's when we started uh, uh, Copy, even though it's, you know, many people would say it's a bit late uh, in the game at a, at a time. Mm -hmm. So I think all of this uh, evolution is really just listening and understanding the customer wants, which sometimes chip and can chip very drastically. So you want to be able to pick those change, pick up those changes very quickly and be very nimble to react to that. Great. And I have a question now. Any one of you can jump in. So how do you navigate language barriers but limited resources that you have to hire good people? Michele? You hire good people <laughs> locally. So <laughs> no, so I mean, I, I think both Lou and, and Santi <laughs> mentioned that, that uh, you need to localize people. So, you know, if you want to be serious in the market, you need to have local people that speak the language and ideally, obviously both speak the local language as well as English so that you don't have a complete loss in translation type of relationship. But yeah, I think having local people everywhere is absolutely key when you, when you, when you go abroad. Very good. And then I'm going to push you a little bit. So all of you kind of started off from Singapore, right? Why Singapore? Uh, Any one of you? So Andrew, are you here yet? Do you have an innovation in Singapore yet? Uh, not yet. We, we meant to start something, but I think COVID last year stopped us from doing so. Mm. That's why I'm, I'm so looking forward to coming back. Thank you. I will remind you. Okay. <laughs> but any of the other three, why Singapore? Uh, so maybe I can talk on this uh, question. Uh, because for us, we started in Singapore. First of all, our background, uh, my husband is actually from Malaysia. Uh, but both of us are Singaporean now. So uh, another very key reason is actually Singapore is really the hotbed for innovation and growth. So we actually are able to, you know, ramp up our innovation very quickly with the resources, the talents, and also support from the government. So for example, last December, we actually had a digital future of work platform launch graced by Minister Chang Chung Singh, who is a big uh, believer in innovation as well. So uh, during the launch, we are actually able to introduce um, technology and uh, pro products that are really COVID related. Uh, so for example, you know, we talk about physical space, but now we are actually uh, beyond that. And we rolled out a platform called Switch that's uh, on demand for people to book it from any time so they can so they can work from anywhere, anytime on a pay per minute usage. 
So I think this is especially um, helpful for COVID for people who are, you know, just dying to come out, still have some human interaction, but they don't want to travel all the way to HQ. Uh, so for, with the Switch platform, we actually wrote it out. Uh, we in CBD and also uh, suburban malls and sports clubs. And then we are also growing this uh, platform now to China, to all our markets across Asia Pacific. So this mm. is a, one of the ways we see why Singapore is a, you know, a great place to start to uh, really roll out the innovation, uh, innovative products. Um, and um, so that's, re that's, that's really the key reason. And I think that's a way we look at it. So one of the emerging trends coming out of COVID is to really uh, continue to listen to our customers locally, but then also how we bring that and channel that into um, commercial products that are really value, adding value to our customers. Very nice. And I think you already answered the question that someone is asking here. Given the challenging uh, so many peers, and yet you have been 10 years in this market of co-working space. So you've actually moved from physical to digital. You can switch on the switch and play, all right, the co-working space online, all right, yes. but working with partners. Michele, why Singapore? This is your first baby. You said officially just now, all the others are not counted, but this is your legitimate first baby. <laughs> why here? Yeah, so, uh, you know, a couple of uh, sets of reasons. One is, I was in Singapore. I was very unhappy with the banks. I thought there was a big gap in the market, and uh, and and that's you know that's where the idea came from. That's one one reason. The second reason, or the second sets of reasons, were more rational about the fact that we thought that uh, to build a regulated wealth manager across the region, and we thought from the very beginning we, we had to go international. So we knew we were going to be multi-country. We thought that starting from Singapore with an MAS license would actually help in then approaching other countries, build a brand that actually goes a little bit across the borders, uh, especially given what we do, right? You know, at the end of the game, Singapore is the wealth capital of, of Southeast Asia. So we, it is the right place to uh, headquarter a company like ours. But, you know, at the, very, at the very beginning, the reason was simply, I was there, I thought it was a gigantic gap in the market because of my own personal experience. And I was trying to build a product to solve my problem. Mm, very good. And the name Stashaway? Where did it come about? It came about in a dinner with, uh, you know, I invited for dinner at my place, four of my smartest former colleagues at Zalora. I offered them wine and food and told them we need to come up with a name. And at the end of the dinner, we had a name. <laughs> That's yeah. how it came about. Okay, and everybody has some money stashed away, right? And you want to help them get a better return. For yeah, no, the, the, idea is, the idea is that if you, you need to think long-term and you need to start early, Mm -hmm. And and so you you know the idea of stashing away you know slowly every month a few hundred dollars a few thousand dollars whatever you can afford will mm -hmm. actually make a big difference in the way you can live your life in the long term so your mm -hmm. your pension etc so you know stashing away over time I think it's a very important that's the, the kind of the, the meaning behind it but the the story okay. is more fun of you know a fun dinner with uh, with former colleagues thank you and I'm going to jump to Dr Sandy Sandy. I know why you start in Singapore, but you can tell us. And then I have another two questions to follow up. Okay, sure. I mean, um, you know, I, I'm not a founder of the company, so far has had you know, reasons, which I'm sure you have heard before. But what I can say is, um, you know, the strength of Singapore, definitely a lot of things that Lou and, and Michele has already said. I would probably just add that, you know, again, reinforce the talent. It's really important having a lot of core talents. That's why we do uh, the tech and other HQ functions all out of Singapore. Another very important reason is it is a, um, a very powerful kind of gateway connecting the world to Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia to the world. And we really take pride on, you know, being found in Singapore, but we are called, we call Southeast Asia our home. And that's why the name C actually, SEA is from Southeast oh. Asia. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it, Singapore is a great place to, to be that kind of portal uh, and where you can, you're close enough and you understand the culture, you can be um, to the Southeast Asia, which is huge untapped potential. Um, at the same time, it's also a great kind of launch pad where you can also go around to the world with you know, great government supports and, 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 you know, all the great talents and capital here as well. Very good. And a very quick one from someone here. What are some of the outcomes and rewards that C has reaped from localizing your e-commerce business in Asia compared to all your other competitors? We shall not name names who the competitors are, okay? But Shopee has localized quite a bit, even in the different markets. Have yeah. you found it rewarding to do so? 
Absolutely. Um, even 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 more so, I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, so choppy right from the start um, were, I, I mean, and still uh, seven version of the apps. So, so it's not like one app where you can travel across country. They all have different, um, not just languages, but also actually different tabs. And, and there's certain things that are specific to certain markets just to cater to both the uh, entrepreneurs as well as uh, consumers in that market. Just, you know, for example, in, in uh, uh, Indonesia, where we have a special tab, we have a program called Kri Kriyasi Nusantara, which is means, you know, I think good asset, hidden assets from, from everywhere, um, mm -hmm. where we really cater products like, you know, locally made, produced, um, because so many great uh, items, uh, entrepreneurs just scattered around, you know, thousands of islands, then really put them into one place where people can find these products and provide them the support and now even trying to help them to even exports to other countries around the region. So things like that is, is really kind of Indonesia specific um, that, that only exists there. And so we localize a, a lot, not just the language, but also our operations uh, and, and everything. And I think it, it's, it's, it's really, uh, really important because you have to remember that Southeast Asia, even though we like to quote, you know, all this huge number of 600 million people and thing, it's, it's really all different countries. They're not just really one region. Very nice, and I agree with you totally. And I have a question now for Andrew, because Andrew, you, you own the space where everybody wanted to be a part of, they want to be in your radar. So what innovations do you think are going to be the game changers, especially in Asia? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, the, the, the things really on, uh, you know, I mentioned before that we, we look at uh, environmental. I think that's a key important part. I think Asia has more commitment to a betterment of our environment. So we look across the matrix of material science and, and uh, also the data to enable consumer to become more environmental. I think that's one aspect. And I think the big uh, artificial intelligence data and robotics is also a big one. It's not just robotics in manufacturing, but it's robotics in entertainment, property management, uh, healthcare, et cetera. And uh, we, we see quite a flourish of this coming out through the COVID. Uh, we use robots to sanitize um, assets, to do customer interfacing when we have issues. But I think a lot of just the position of hardware, software, and betterment of customer experience. I know it's very broad, but I think these are very broad area that I think COVID brought about, let these factors surface up that we can actually see who are the better ones. Mm, very good, thank you. I think a lot of people in the audience are starting to put business plans for you already. <laughs> okay, as they Looking listen forward. to you. Okay, I'm going to jump to another one because this one is again generic. How do you make a startup a unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> hey come on they're all looking their dreams are built on you you are the example look, so <clears throat> look i don't so my answer is i don't know and obviously uh, even if i knew i guess it wouldn't take 10 seconds to explain but if i have to uh, distill it as much as possible my personal point of view is that you can't build a company thinking you know about its value you need to build a company thinking about what i believe are the two most important ingredients on one side are your clients. So thinking, you know, putting clients at the center, trying to listen to them, trying to solve their problems like Santi mentioned earlier. And on the other side, obviously are your team members, your employees, your, you know, every, everybody that works toward, toward that goal. I think your, as a founder, particularly, your job is really to maximize value for these two sets of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Everything else will come from by itself. Nice yeah, said. yeah, yeah I think that's a great answer. Maybe I can add to that as well, um, because Jasco um, is a unicorn today. Um, so we're very uh, lucky that we already hit the status. But uh, I want to say first is um, really starting with the right people. So I think that's absolutely important. So we have a very visionary um, CEO and founder, but mm. really supported by a team of very young and ambitious people mm. who are able to you know, really commit. So we have people who started with us eight, nine, 10 years ago, but also uh, now we've grown to a team of over 300 people. So we also have a lot of external hires that give us fresh mm -hmm. perspectives uh, you know, that really help us to uh, have diversity and roll out innovation very quickly. So I think that's definitely the key. Uh, and then the, and other things I mentioned, like strong local partners. So when you do things uh, 
everything, you know, uh, you have to make sure you have the support uh, inside and outside. So uh, how we ramp up very quickly, you know, uh, to the new market is really mm -hmm. by having strong local partners. And okay. then uh, lastly, I would definitely say, you know, having the customers in mind, because uh, whatever we do, we have to make sure we are a very sustainable business. We're not here just to, you know, grow shares and get you know, paper value, but we really have to have a legit business and adding value to our customers and stakeholders every day so i think that's very important to always listen to your customers so mm -hmm. like the innovation i mentioned switch you know to enable people to enable people to work from anywhere anytime is actually mm -hmm. feedback coming from our customers so we know mm -hmm. that's what they need and then you know uh because of covid we'll also roll out uh, ai technology mm -hmm. that will detect the um crowdedness of the space is exactly because people want to be safe when they are, uh, you know, working in a co-working space. So mm -hmm. the uh, Sixth Sense will actually help us ensure social distancing. And I heard about Robux uh, from Andrew earlier on. So that's also how uh, we rolled out uh, robotic uh, barista. So now we mm -hmm. have uh, robot arms that make I coffee know. for us. Uh, again, <laughs> yeah, very the coffee, efficient. The coffee robot. Yes. Yeah, coffee robot. They can make uh, uh, American coffee, but also Nanyang coffee and cocktails. <laughs> so again, it's some feedback from you know our customers that they want to have a very um, productive environment, not just for work, but also for fun. And yes. you know, of course, uh, with the COVID concern and everything, you know, we decide to also do this robot thing. Thank you. Uh, so I think the final thing I will leave uh, everyone uh, hopefully will help you know our our young. Um, professionals who are looking to to grow and build their business is really listening to your customers so all your innovations won't be like pie in the sky but mm. they actually make commercial sense and add value to them thank you and sandy i'm going to ask you this one because this is from uh, one of our audience so where else is the c group looking to expand in the near future is this uh, possible for, for you to answer all right kind of you know yeah, the big dream. You are now more than a unicorn. You are already <laughs> listed. Yeah. So, of course, everyone wants to be a C. All right. So, where do you go for your next step? Where do you want to expand in the near future? Uh, hard for me to answer that question, but I'll try to tie this in with the previous question as well, yeah. which I think is sure. really important. I mean, I agree very, very much with Nikolai that, you know, we shouldn't really just aim on based on evaluation to be unicorn and agree with the importance of the people and listening to, to the customer that, that Luz just said. I will add one more thing that you want to solve uh, the problems for your customers, but I think you also want to make sure that the problems are big enough and hard enough um, so that you can keep really going. Because you solve a really small problem, it's really nice, but then um, you, know, you, you can get to your, 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 your finish line pretty quickly and that's it, right? Um, so if you, you, you should really solve a big problem. So in our case, for example, um, you know, we want to connect uh, people around the world using games. Uh, we want to, uh, in e-commerce, really help connect cons consumers and, and um, uh, SMEs and entrepreneurs. And despite all the rapid growth that we have seen in e-commerce in this Southeast Asia in the past few years, it's still penetration is still very low. It's still only around five, six percent of total retail sales, which means a huge amount uh, to go. Same thing in financial, digital financial services. Um, more than two thirds of people in this region is still either unbanked or underbanked. So this massive pain point that needs to be solved uh, using technology uh, and, and can be used using technology, you know, including what, what uh, Mikhail is saying and what he's doing, which is really, really great, great kind of democratizing that uh, wealth management as well. So I think all, all of these things uh, is really important. Go back to make sure that the, the question you're trying to answer, the problem you're trying to solve is big enough and that you're really passionate about it. About it. Very good. I know you're all amazing, but I'm watching the clock because I promised people that 2.20, 2.25. So I'm going to go to the last round. But I'm going to try and give you a targeted question because there were so many coming up. So I'm going to try and target, but yet at the same time, there's a generic message. So I'm going to start with you, Andrew. Uh, you know, for many of us here in this market, mm -hmm. what are some of the markets in Asia where you see the most opportunities for expansion? What word of advice would you give to our young all right, entrepreneurs out there, which market do you think they should start? Even though you tell them Singapore is great, but in your mind, which market do you think they definitely should have presence and why? Yep. Um, I think uh, naturally our first choice is the Greater Bay Area because I think just a sheer number of growing populations, middle class coming through. And the second one 
was, as some of the speakers also said, Southeast Asia, because you see where the money will be coming from, where the people are growing. I think for me, the Greater Bay Area, the next one, Southeast Asia in general. Hmm. So Greater Bay, meaning it will be Guangzhou? Uh, well, Shenzhen. Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, because there are 80 million people there and fast growing middle-class income group. Yes. Uh, wouldn't it be magical if it's Greater Bay Area together with Southeast Asia? And yes. You- I think, I think definitely, because we, we see, although it's a greater bay in, in Hong Kong, and, but then Singapore, the SCA area, is also a big bay, bay area, because Bay Area is talking about economy in surrounding uh, uh, neighboring countries. So the two, they're really, I mean, that's why for us, mm. Hong Kong is a base, Singapore is also another base that we're looking at there. Yeah. So people who keep thinking Hong Kong and Singapore are actually competitors, actually the secret is- No, complimentary. Thank you, Andrew. And I expect you to open an innovation center for the Sino Group in Singapore. I hope so, I definitely hope so. Hopefully with us at SMU. Yes, yes, definitely. (laughs) Put that in, okay? Okay, now I come to you, Michele. What word of advice do you have for all our wonderful entrepreneurs out there? A uh, couple of things, maybe one is you need to, uh, if you start, if you decide to start a company, you need to know that it will take a long time. So you need to have a lot of grit, a lot of stamina. You can't, you don't imagine that it will take, you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months. It's very rare that it happens. And if it happens, you haven't planned for it. So plan for a very, very long journey. Make sure that you have the right set of motivations to actually go along the journey and the right set of motivation do not include building a unicorn the right set of motivation includes solving a problem you're passionate about uh going deep into it making sure as santi mentioned that it's big enough and obviously as i mentioned making sure that you build a team of people that are really committed to uh, what you're what you're trying to do i guess that's uh, the, the the biggest thing just plan for the long term and uh, assume there's going to be a lot of ups and downs and uh, and focus on the right set of things Thank you very much. And for you, Lou, there are many female entrepreneurs out there and they are looking at you. And, you know, in the startup world, we are very much a minority. So what word of advice do you have for all my female entrepreneurs? Guys, I'm sorry. All right, this one only Lou can answer. (laughs) Okay, I'll offer my secret from, you know, my special point of view (laughs) as a woman leader. Okay, so um, some, of it, some of it is actually similar to what McKelly just said. Um, so we are schoolmates, but we also think a lot as uh, co-founders, I guess. <laughs> so uh, one thing is for me very important is really pick something that you enjoy doing. So because um, entrepreneurship is a long journey, it's also um, quite a difficult journey. So if you do, don't do something you are passionate about, you won't be able to do it day in and out and succeed at the end and really treat it as a journey. Um, sometimes you cannot be too fixated about the results. You just really have to enjoy the process every step of the way. So that comes a passion and a commitment to whatever you choose to do. And then second thing is um, as a woman, I will say, um, uh, men uh, as well sometimes that we have many priorities um, both at work and also in our life so mm-hmm. uh, it's very important to have your priorities right uh, for me it's actually life and then work because if you are not happy you know personally how do you uh, bring out your best at work and really contribute right so you really need to achieve the balance so it's about working very very smartly you know uh, start with a big direction and then go in mind before you mm-hmm. just jumping and do the detailed execution part mm-hmm. and then um, also having the right people to do it with you so for me i mentioned i love the team who work uh, the team of people that i work with mm-hmm. uh, some of them started with us eight nine ten years ago so they're really like family to me mm-hmm. uh, then uh, also um, the portfolio that i am responsible for is, is also uh, aligning very well with my passion which is mm-hmm. again about people so mm-hmm. i do a lot of member engagement to make sure whatever the service we provide to them is always value adding and so they can really derive the best out of the experience with justco and then i spend a lot of my time training up um, um, the young and uh, women leaders within our organization. So that's uh, also something I feel, uh, you know, really aligning with my heart, you know, what I enjoy doing day in and day out. So uh, people inside JustCo can also become individual contributors and leaders. 
um, you know, to, to perform their best at work. So I think uh, these are probably some advice I would give. Very nice. So first, Thank you very much, Lou. Yeah. The human the touch is very strong. And yes. Sandy, you get the final word. So we are going to be announcing you know, the winners of our competition in a little while. What word of advice do you have? You know, C, Garina, whatever name, have gone through a long journey. So what advice do you have for all the startups, even after winning uh, the LKY competition? That, that's, that's a uh, perfect question because actually we just think about that. There's a, um, you know, our core values, which I uh, identify the most with, which is we stay humble. And I think that's really, really important um, because I think after a while, um, you know, all of you are going to go out there and going to be very successful. The winner, of, of course, of this competition is very successful. But at some point, you don't want the success to become your enemy and actually slow you down. How do you stay hungry? How do you stay focused? How do you stay committed? I think that's really the key. So I think um, uh, humility is really essentially the core set of values that allow you to keep going um, um, at, 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 at a pace and stay very focused. So I think that that's probably something that we have to always, and I think it's a muscle actually, that you have to keep building um, over time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You know, this is amazing. I'm going to pass the mic to back to Jeremiah in a while. But actually, if you listen hard and clear, all right, there are a couple of wonderful P's that have been articulated. I think every startup that I know who actually became a unicorn always know what their purpose is. And the second big P, which I'm hearing loud and clear from all my panelists, is passion. If you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to get anywhere. And the third P that I'm hearing a lot in spite of the world of technology and artificial intelligence, it's people. Customers are your people, your you know, staff are your people, your stakeholders around you, your partners are all your people. So on this triple P all right, platform, I'm gonna say a big thank you, SMU and IIE are totally grateful that you have been so authentic in all your sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, okay. thank you so much, guys. Uh, before before you leave me, before you leave me, I, I do have a couple of things. First of all, uh, thank you, Prof. Annie, uh, truly an academic, uh, summarizing it uh, in a very concise manner with the three Ps. Uh, so thank you for that. And of course, to all of our uh, panelists, uh, I would like to thank you for all of your insights. Prof. Annie mentioned there were a couple of uh, uh, wise uh, takeaways, but I think there's more than a couple, uh, especially if you're a startup and you're looking about uh, localization or where to actually expand your business growth. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of takeaways. And what I want to do now is I want to take a, a quick photo, a quick group photo. Um, and if everyone, it's good that we're all virtual. So that means that we don't have our masks on. So that means we can actually smile and people can actually see that. So um, I'm going to cue you guys in three, two, one. We'll take a nice uh, group photo. Okay. Uh, and we'll be taking a screenshot. Okay. So everyone, can I get your brightest smiles in three, two, one, smile. All right, perfect. Let me check if I've got that. Okay, perfect. That's a, a great group photo. And um, before you leave me as well, to all of our participants, I actually want to bring on our graphic uh, recorder, who is uh, Ming Li. And uh, we've been doing this for a couple of sessions uh, for the change makers, oh. whereby we invite an illustrator or a graphic recorder to actually uh, piece down and pen down his insights and his uh, takeaways in a graphical manner. So you can see here, these are some of the takeaways that he's uh, been able to uh, uh, jot down from the session that we just had. Uh, obviously, you have your beautiful faces, uh, Prof. Annie, uh, Michele, Lou, Santi, and Andrew uh, all at the bottom. And then you can see some of the key takeaways uh, like evolution. It's, it's largely listening to what the, uh, what the customers want. Um, and it's going to be uh, filled up subsequently um, for all of our viewers. I this is my favorite part of the change makers conversation because I'm a very visual person. So I like to see everything in, in a nice, concise uh, visual piece. So if you want to get access to uh, this uh, illustration, all you need to do is uh, look out for uh, your email inbox. Uh, we will be sending uh, this across to you, or you can just head on to our website to find it as well. Um, and yeah, so uh, apart from the uh, graphic recording, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of our partners as well. Um, and um, I believe we have a slide uh, for all of our partners. Uh, I, I think we'll show that later during the event. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, last of all, we also want to request that everyone fills in an event feedback form. Uh, obviously, I think what's good about uh, uh, 
consistently, um, you know, uh, hosting events is that we have this desire to uh, make the next event better than uh, the current one. And in order to do that, we want to hear from the customer, right, guys? Uh, so that's why we want to hear from you. Um, so if you can help me to fill in the uh, feedback form by scanning the QR code, uh, that would be absolutely perfect. Um, and finally, once we've done with all these announcements, uh, I want to thank all of our um, uh, panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Annie, for moderating the session. Uh, thank you so much, Michele. Uh, thank you so much, Lou. Thank you so much, uh, Santi and Andrew as well. You guys have been an absolute pleasure to listen. Uh, and uh, for all of the rest of our attendees, please continue to stay tuned as uh, the winner's announcement uh, will be happening very shortly for the 10th Lee Kuan Yew Global Business Plan Competition. And who else will you see but my face? Not, like, <laughs> not with this virtual background, but uh, we're on the actual stage, okay? So thank you so much, speakers, and thank you, Prof. Annie. Uh, and to the audience, I'll catch you uh, in a short five minutes, okay? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good weekend. You too. You too. You too. You too. You too.